Welcome to Literary and Jury Charge Practice. We'll start out with some jury charge. Ready? Here we go. In order to meet its burden of proof with respect to counts two and three, the government must establish beyond a reasonable doubt with respect to each count the following elements of the crime of securities fraud. First, that in connection with the purchase or sale of the security specified in the count you are considering, Mr. Martoma employed a device, scheme, or artifice to defraud or engaged in an act, practice, or course of business that operated or would operate as a fraud or deceit upon a purchaser or seller of the specified security. Second, that Mr. Martoma acted willfully, knowingly, and with the intent to defraud. And third, that the defendant knowingly used or caused to be used any means or instrument of transportation or communication in interstate commerce or the mails or any facility of any national securities exchange in furtherance of the fraudulent conduct. I will now instruct you on each of these elements in detail. First element, existence of a fraudulent scheme. The first element that the government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt is that in connection with the purchase or sale of Elon Securities in count two and in connection with the purchase or sale of Wyeth Securities in count three, Mr. Martoma employed a device, scheme, or artifice to defraud or engage in an act, practice, or course of business that operated or would operate as a fraud or deceit upon a seller of the specified stock. A device, scheme, or artifice to defraud is merely a plan for the accomplishment of any fraudulent objective. Fraud is a general term that embraces all efforts and means that individuals devise to take unfair advantage of others. The specific device, scheme, or artifice to defraud or act, practice, or course of business that the government alleges Mr. Martoma employed in connection with counts two and three is known as insider trading. An insider is one who comes into possession of material non-public information about a security or stock by virtue of a relationship that involves trust and confidence. If a person has such inside information in his position of trust or confidence, prohibits him from disclosing that information, the law prohibits him from buying or selling the securities in question on the basis of that information or giving that information to others so that they can trade in such securities on the basis of that information. The law also prohibits a person who is not actually an insider from trading in securities based on material non-public information if the person knows that the material non-public information was intended to be kept confidential and knows that the information was disclosed in breach of a duty of trust or confidence and in exchange for a personal benefit to the insider. Counts 2 and 3 charge that Mr. Martoma engaged in insider trading as a tippy, that is, that he obtained material non-public information and wrongfully used it for his own benefit when he knew that the information had been disclosed in violation of a duty of trust and confidence. A person who receives material non-public information engages in an act of fraud or deceit under the federal securities laws if he buys or sells securities based on material non-public information that he knows was disclosed by another person in breach of a duty of trust and confidence and in exchange for a personal benefit to the insider. I caution you, however, that trading on information that does not originate from an insider is not illegal. The law permits analysts and portfolio managers to meet and speak with corporate officers and other insiders, as well as experts affiliated with such companies, 
in order to check out and analyze information useful in making investment decisions. I want to emphasize that the receipt and use of material non-public information does not violate the law unless the inside information was improperly provided to the defendant by an insider or tipper in violation of the duties and obligations that person owed to the company that owned the information and the defendant knew that the insider or tipper had violated that duty in disclosing the inside information to the defendant and had done so in exchange for a personal benefit. The insider's or tipper's breach of a duty and the defendant's knowledge of that breach must be established before a defendant can be found to have unlawfully engaged in a device, scheme, or artifice to defraud by trading on material non-public information. The government alleges that Dr. Sidney Gilman, referred to as Dr. One in the indictment, and Dr. Joel Ross, referred to as Dr. Two in the indictment, were insiders involved in the clinical trial who tipped Mr. Martoma or disclosed inside information to him in breach of a duty of trust and confidence they owed to Elon and Wyeth. Mr. Martoma is not charged with being an insider, but rather is charged with, with being a tippy. A tippy is someone who receives inside information and uses it for his own benefit even though he did not personally owe any duty of trust or confidence which prevented him from buying and selling the securities in question. To summarize, in order to find that the government has established the first element of the crime of insider trading, namely that in connection with the purchase or sale of a security, Mr. Martoma employed a device, scheme, or artifice to defraud or engaged in a course of conduct that operated or would operate as a fraud or deceit upon a purchaser or seller of the specified security, the government must prove the following beyond a reasonable doubt that Dr. Gilman or Dr. Ross, the alleged insiders or tippers, had a fiduciary or other relationship of trust and confidence with Elon as to count two or Wyeth as to count three, that Dr. Gilman or Dr. Ross breached that duty of trust and confidence by disclosing material non-public information about the phase two clinical trial to Mr. Martoma, that Dr. Gilman or Dr. Ross personally benefited in some way, directly or indirectly, from the disclosure of the allegedly inside information to Mr. Martoma, that Mr. Martoma knew that the information he obtained had been disclosed in breach of a duty owed by Dr. Gilman or Dr. Ross to Elon or Wyeth, and in exchange for a personal benefit to Dr. Gilman or Dr. Ross, and that Mr. Martoma used the material non-public information he received in connection with the purchase or sale of Elon Securities Count 2 or Wyeth Securities Count 3. Now for some literary practice. Here we go. Roger S. Pinsky, 79, is nicknamed the captain, but his name is synonymous with motorsports, auto dealerships, truck leasing, and a host of other related enterprises. 
In 1958, the then 21-year-old Pinsky launched his racing career at the Marlboro Motor Raceway in Upper Marlboro, Maryland. Today, the former driving champion presides over a race car empire. His team has captured first place at the Indy 500 on 16 separate occasions, the most by anyone. Small wonder that the Automotive Hall of Fame in Dearborn, Michigan inducted him in 2015. Penske has taken just as many victory laps in the business world. Starting with a Chevrolet lot in 1965, Penske now owns more than 150 car dealerships in the U.S. and more than 100 overseas. Chances are you've seen a rental truck bearing the Penske name. More than 200,000 of them are on roads worldwide. What has been the biggest change in racing over the years? Racing has really come such a long way in safety and we are always looking to try and improve in this area. Which autos in your collection do you prize the most? Probably the cars that have the most memories and meaning are our race cars. For example, we have all but three of our 16 Indianapolis 500 winning cars, and those are pretty special. Which car brings back the best memories? I certainly have fond memories of some of the first cars I raced, like the Corvette or the Catalina, but each car we have raced has its own appeal and character. What is the best advice anyone ever gave you? My father always told me that effort equals results. We have used that message in all of our businesses since the beginning, and it still rings true today. Which is most important, the car or the driver? The beauty of racing is that the two need to work together in order to be successful. The driver needs to know how to get the most out of the car and the vehicle needs to be well prepared and reliable so drivers can do their job and make the most of their skills. Do you welcome or dread a future of self-driving cars? The technology that is being created for autonomous vehicles is really amazing. Personally, I still like to drive my vehicles and there are probably a lot of people who feel the same way but self-driving cars are a great option for some. I know our Team Penske drivers want to stay where they are behind the wheel of their race cars. What advice would you give a student today who is fascinated with cars? Learn as much as you can about the cars and the technology of today. How would you like to be remembered? I don't plan on going anywhere soon, but after the last checkered flag, I hope I am remembered as a racer and a fair competitor who tried to give a little something back to the sport that gave me so much along the way. some jury charge practice. Ready? Here we go. I will now define for you several of the terms relevant to determining the first element of insider training securities fraud. First element, part one, existence of a fiduciary relationship. The government must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Dr. Gilman and Dr. Ross had a fiduciary or other relationship of trust and confidence with Elon as to count two and with Wyatt as to count three and as a result of that relationship 
were entrusted with material non-public information with the reasonable expectation that they would keep it confidential and would not use it for personal benefit. It is the nature of the relationship which determines whether a person is an insider and not merely the title he or she holds. A mere working relationship is not sufficient to satisfy this element. For a person to be an insider, the nature of the relationship must be one of trust and confidence, whether such a fiduciary or other relationship of trust or confidence existed between the alleged insiders, in this case Dr. Gilman and Dr. Ross, and Elon or Wyeth, is a question of fact for you to determine. The duties and obligations of insiders may be expressed explicitly, explicitly in writing or may be inferred from the nature and circumstances of the party's relationship. However, the alleged insiders must have recognized the existence of a relationship of trust and confidence, although the understanding or mutual relation, mutual recognition may be either expressed or implied. First element, part two, breach of fiduciary relationship, non-public information, materiality. If you find that Dr. Gilman and Dr. Ross had a fiduciary or other relationship of trust and confidence with Elon or Wyeth, then you must next consider whether the government has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that they intentionally breached that duty of trust and confidence by disclosing material non-public non-public information for their own personal benefit. I will now define the terms non-public and material. Information is non-public if it is not available to the public through sources such as press releases, securities and exchange commission filings, scientific journals, trade publications, analyst reports, newspapers, magazines, television, radio, rumors, word of mouth, websites, internet chat rooms, or online message boards. In assessing whether information is non-public, the keyword is available. If information is available, for example, in the me public media, analysts report scientific journals or SEC filings, it is public. However, the fact that information has not appeared in the newspaper or other widely available public media does not alone determine whether the information is non-public. Sometimes a corporation authorizes the release of information or is otherwise willing to make information available to securities analysts, prospective investors, or members of the press who ask for it, even though it may never have appeared in any newspaper or other publication. Such information would be considered public. For example, if Wyatt, Elon or Wyeth policy was to give out certain information to people who ask for it. That information is public information. Accordingly, information is not necessarily non-public simply because there has been no formal announcement or because only a few people have been made aware of it. On the other hand, the confirmation by an insider of unconfirmed facts or rumors, even if reported in a newspaper or analyst report may itself be inside information, a tip from an insider that is more reliable and specific than unconfirmed facts of or public rumors is non-public information despite the existence of such rumors in the media or investment community. The government must also prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the information Dr. Gilman or Dr. Ross disclosed was material at the time it was disclosed. Material information is information that a reasonable investor would have considered significant in deciding whether to buy, sell, or hold securities and at what price to buy or sell securities. Put another way, there must be a substantial likelihood that the information at issue would have been viewed by the reasonable investor as having significantly altered the total mix of information then available. In determining whether the information Dr. Gilman and Dr. Ross allegedly provided to Mr. Martoma prior to the July 29, 2008 ICAD conference was material, you may consider, among other things, evidence of movement in the price of Elon or Wyeth stock. 
after the presentation of data concerning the phase two clinical trial was made at the ICAD conference and other evidence as to whether this information was known to market participants or was substantially the same as information previously announced. You have heard testimony in this case about how certain medical professionals, including Dr. Gilman, Dr. Ross, and Dr. Wisniewski, viewed the data and results of the Phase two clinical trial that were presented at the ICAD conference. I want to caution you that in determining whether the information Dr. Ross or Dr. Gilman alleged, allegedly disclosed to Mr. Martoma was material, you must consider this issue from the perspective of a reasonable investor, not from the perspective of members of the medical community. All right, that will conclude our literary and jury charge practice.